In this third video, thinking about calculations that we carry out routinely in molecular biology, we're going to move on to think about calculations involving interconversion of volumes and dilutions. So let's begin by taking a perhaps curious step back, um, something which many people will feel intuitively that they get, but is helpful as we go, go forward in thinking about the calculations. I'd like you to imagine that you had a bottle containing 10 molecules of a substance. Now, we know that there would be many, many, many millions times more molecules present. But for simplicity, there are 10 molecules of a substance in this bottle. If we were add to, to add to that the same amount of water, the same volume of water, so that there was twice as much volume overall, how many molecules of the substance would we have? Well, the answer is that we still have 10 molecules. We haven't made molecules. We haven't destroyed molecules. We've just diluted them. So from, we've gone from having one lot of 10 molecules to having essentially two volumes worth of five molecules in each. And just to continue that line of reasoning, if you imagine now that you had your one volume with 10 molecules in it, and you now added nine more, so that overall we had 10 times the overall volume. How many molecules would we have? How many uh, molecules would be present in each of those different uh, bottles, if we, if we thought of it in that, in that term? And the answer is that there would be one per unit. So we've gone from having one lot of 10 to having 10 lots of one. Now that may seem really ridiculously straightforward, but it, I think you'll find it helpful, some of you will certainly will find it helpful to think about that uh, when we come to look at some dilution calculations in a moment. Now just before we move on from this, a couple of jargony phrases that will crop up. So when we talk about this, when we go from having one volume to adding nine more of the same volume, so we've got ten volumes worth overall, that's described as being a tenfold dilution. And so in other words, if we had one volume and we added 99 volumes of water to that, that would be a hundredfold dilution. So that's what that phrase means. And secondly, uh, we might, if, if, if the final volume that we needed for a reaction was one molecule per, per bottle, as it is on the right hand side here, then we might describe that initial solution as being a ten times stock. It's got a concentration that's 10 times what we would need for a reaction. And that, again, is a phrase that will crop up later on. So, as I said then, the core to thinking about these sorts of calculations is remembering that we're neither creating nor destroying a substance. We're just diluting it. And so the amount we had at the start of a reaction, or at the start of a dilution, rather, is the same as the amount that we've got at the end. And to put that slightly more mathematically, the volume that we had initially multiplied by the concentration that we had initially is going to be the same as the final volume times the final concentration. And we would sometimes, on the left hand side there, we would sometimes say stock volume times stock concentration, but it's the same thing. Now that's an awful lot of uh, writing to do in a calculation. So we would rather inst instead describe that as being V1 times C1, or Vs times Cs. V1 times C1 equals Vf times Cf. And that is the basis of all of these sorts of calculations that we're just going to talk about now. And routinely, you would be given three of those bits of information, and you need to work out what the fourth one is. So let's look at an example. If we had 250 microliters of a 30 millimolar potassium chloride solution, and that was made up to a final volume of 50 milliliters, what concentration would it be? Now I would start out by writing down uh, the, uh, the standard equation that we're thinking about. I wouldn't write down routinely that full version each time, but I would literally write down V1 equals C1 equals Vf times Cf every time we did a calculation of this sort. And then we put into this the items that we know. So we know that we're beginning with 250 microliters at a 30 millimolar concentration and that we end up with 50 milliliters. 
And so the unknown in this case is the final concentration. This is the term that we're going to be trying to find. Now, if there's any way that people do get caught out with these sorts of calculations, it's actually not making sure that the units are the same on both sides to begin with. So if you notice, we've got 250 microliters on the left, 50 millilitres on the right. And so we want to make sure that those are in the same units to begin with. And so the easier thing to do then is to change the unit on the left hand side to be 0.25 millilitres. Same, same volume, 250 microliters is 0.25 millilitres. But now we've got the units are the same on both sides of the equation here. And as a result of that, I now know that my unknown, the units for that are going to be millimolar, the same as they are on the left hand side here. So 0.25 millilitres times 30 millimolar equals 50 mil times our unknown number of millimolar and I would then uh, keep in the units in the I would write down the units in, in the lines all the way up until that point and then we can say well 0.25 multiplied by 30 divided by 50 is our unknown and so that's going to be 0.15 millimolar or 150 micromolar so as has been said in some of the previous videos we don't want to see huge numbers of, of zeros after a decimal point nor do we want to see lines with 10 to the minus a big number uh, being listed but in this kind of calculation this kind of range 0.15 millimolar would be an acceptable way of reporting the number but if you wanted to you could convert down to 150 micromolar that's going to be um, just a matter of personal preference unless it's been particularly specified in the in the question what units you should be using at the end. So that's a fairly straightforward example. Here's one for you to try. So same sort of principles if 400 microliters of a 50 millimolar glucose solution is made up to a final volume of 200 milliliters what concentration will it be? So you might want to pause this video for a moment work on that calculation and then I'll, I'll work through the calculation for you in a moment. OK, let's see how you got on. So as I've stated previously, the, the first thing I would do every time is to write down VI times CI equals VF times CF. We put in the information that we know. So we've got 400 microliters, uh, 50 millimolar, final volume 200 mils. So again, as in the previous example, it's the final concentration that we're trying to work out in this case. Looking at this, uh, once more, the units are different for volume on the two sides of the equation. So I want to make sure that those are the same. And the easiest thing then again is to turn the first unit there into millilitres. So 0.4 millilitres times 50 millimolar is 200 millilitres times our unknown. And I now know the units of this are millimolar because this one and this one were the same. And so this unit and this unit are going to be the same. So I'm trying to work out my unknown concentration in millimolar. So I've got 0.14 times 50 divided by 200 will give me my answer in millimolar. And that's either then going to be 0.1 millimolar or 100 micromolar. And again, that kind of to only one decimal place is acceptable. If it was any more than that, you might perhaps uh, switch over to talking about micromolar instead. So fairly straightforward examples uh, and again something that will crop up fairly fairly regularly. You might get calculations of a different sort. For example, it might ask you how much of a stock solution you're going to need to make up a, a, a larger volume at a smaller concentration afterwards. But it's the same principle. We're always each time using this equation and we're putting into it the three bits of information that we've got and we're trying to find out the fourth term, making sure along the way that we've matched our units.